<laughs> I gotta have courage. Courage, <laughs> courage. So, what is it that you haven't done because of fear? In Ooh. other words, do you have to do something today that requires courage? Taxes. I have to face the IRS. Oh, <laughs> that, that makes perfect sense. It that does makes make perfect sense. So, but it indicates you have the courage to face that demon, that mm -hmm. IRS demon, right. and confront them and face them down and do well. Good for you. Good Thanks, for you. Jim. Thanks. Yeah. Hi, I'm Julie King, and this is Dr. James Wanless, and he will be your guide today to assist you in the ancient art of reading the tarot. Dr. Wanless, could you tell me what the tarot is? Sure, the tarot is a, is a fascinating subject that goes back to ancient Egypt. In Egypt, the tarot was originally a wisdom book, a philosophy of life. Now, the word tarot is an ancient Egyptian word that means ta ro or royal road. So the tarot is a pathway to the complete realization of our full human potentials. But then what happens is that the tarot goes underground mysteriously for a large period of time and resurfaces in the Middle Ages as a card deck, as the deck of cards that we know it of as today. Now, it's used as a card deck in the Middle Ages in, in the light of a fortune-telling tool, an oracle. But in today's so-called New Age, we have a whole constellation of the tarot, many, many new decks. And in this so-called New Age, we view the tarot as a form of psychology. The tarot acts as a kind of map of consciousness. I understand that you've received your doctorate in political science. How did you get from political science to the tarot? Oh, that's a good <laughs> question that many people ask often. And really, it's a question of my own spiritual odyssey, if you will. I, um, teaching political science, I was always fascinated in how we can peacefully transform societies and came to the realization that we have to begin with the individual and with self-transformation. So it became imperative for me to study and practice the various self-transformation pathways. And so for that, I went to a Tibetan Buddhist monastery and I learned how to visualize positive mental images of a very powerful symbolic nature. And then from there, I went to a Burmese meditation master and learned how to meditate on myself, to see myself in a pure, objective, non-judgmental kind of way. And shortly after that, I went to Guatemala and studied with a Guatemalan shaman who taught me how to create my own symbology or symbolic system. And then in San Francisco, I was very fortunate to meet a Basque vision maker who gave me my first tarot reading. I thought, wow, this is hot stuff. This is incredible alchemy that can really transform people immediately. And so the tarot has been kind of the culmination of my spiritual journey up to the present time, for the tarot is like a meditation. It's a powerful self-transformation practice that includes symbolic images as well as visualization. So for the past 12 years, the tarot has been my personal spiritual practice as well as my professional career. Well, Dr. Wanless, you created the Voyager tarot deck, this deck that we're looking at here, mm -hmm. with Ken Knudsen, could you tell me how this compares to other tarot decks? Well, the Voyager is truly a universal deck. You know, there's the Voyager spacecraft out there in the heavens right now. It's that marvelous piece of science and technology that's taken the great pictures of Jupiter and Saturn is now on its way to Neptune. Well, the Voyager tarot deck is named after that because the Voyager spacecraft is showing us the external universe while the Voyager tarot deck is a journey to the inner universe. And so it shows us as great as the galaxies and as detailed and as incredible as the smallest of the molecules. And so it's a real journey into our human nature, the universe that we are. And it represents, therefore, that wonderful old concept that each of us is a microcosm of the macrocosmic universe. Each of us is a small universe. 
When I've noticed other tarot decks, they all have kings and queens and princes and that sort of uh, symbology in it. What about the Voyager Tarot? Right. Traditional tarot decks are medieval in nature. And what I wanted to do in this deck is take it out of the Middle Ages and represent those great universal ancient principles of life with contemporary modern symbols. So instead of swords, for example, we have crystals. Instead of the royalty cards, we have what are called the human family. So the Voyager is a deck that anyone can relate to because it's composed of natural and human symbols that are part of our everyday world. So it's not a deck that we need to spend years reading about, becoming an initiate in order to learn it. It's something that we know just because of our everyday world. Well, I'm particularly attracted to the stunning imagery on the back of the card. Could you tell me what this symbol represents? Right. The symbol on the back of the card is DNA. It is the human genetic chromosome. And it symbolizes like the great rose windows in the old Gothic cathedrals in Europe, the unfoldment of the self. It is like that rose. And so the tarot, that's what it's all about. It's designed to help us unfold and flower as human beings. As well, it represents the fact that we are one people. This is one planet. And it shows our commonality. So the Voyager is truly a cross-cultural kind of symbology. It is transracial. It is cross-ethnic. So anybody from any culture, any race, any ethnic group can relate and understand this universal symbolic language. Now, I grew up thinking of the tarot as a fortune-telling tool. Could I use the Voyager that way? Well, sure. Uh, the Voyager, like any tarot deck, is full of symbols, picture symbols and images. And what they do is they spark our creative intuition. We see a picture of the moon or the sun, and we get an idea from that. And then we relate that idea to ourselves or to another if we're doing a reading for them. Now, the value of the Voyager is it has a lot of symbols and therefore sparks many, many kinds of, of intuitions. The other thing about the Voyager as a fortune-telling tool is that the process, the artistic rendering of the deck is done in the form of collage. So the Voyager is like a dream montage. When we read the, the cards, we're doing what I call a waking dream. And in the waking dream, we allow the subconscious information to come through us, as in the real dream world. Now, the other thing I want to talk about with reading the future is that tarot is primarily an information system. What it does is it allows us to see our possible future. But in seeing the possible future, we've already begun to alter it. Our very consciousness alters the future. So we can never really see the future for exactly the way it's going to be. But what we get is information about our future. And with that information, we can make more informed choices. And so the tarot is not a deterministic, cast in fate in stone kind of system at all. It's really a system to give us greater choice and flexibility uh, in our lives. And so I like to do the kind of reading where we ask the question, what is it I want to create in my future? Better health, love, money, growth, whatever it might be, and use the cards as a vehicle to take us to creating that desired future. In other words, we use the tarot to help us see our path to creating the future that we want to create. Okay, so I can work with the tarot in a traditional reading. Mm -hmm. What else can I do with the tarot deck? But really, the bottom line of the tarot is personal growth. Anytime we use the cards in a meditative way or in a reading way or just a philosophical way of study, we are growing. Every card gives us an indication of our lessons as well as showing our opportunities and potentials. The, the, the strength of the tarot deck and cards is in the symbolic image. 
The reason the tarot has existed for thousands of years is because the power of the picture. And so every time we see our lesson or our opportunity, we get the juice, the fuel, the power to learn that lesson and to realize that opportunity as a result of the power of that image. And the way we really grow is using the power of these images consistently and constantly over time. And that's why I recommend a practice that I call a card a day. So every day we select a card in the morning, what's my lesson and what's my opportunity. So why don't you do that? Okay. Sounds Let's see like what fun. You, yeah, I hope so. Let's see what you come okay. up with today for your lesson and your opportunity. Oh, I think it's this one. Oh, great. All right. Um, this is the card. It's called Fulfillment, and it's represented by full cups. And so your lesson for the day is how to fill up my heart how to be fulfilled emotionally today so that I really radiate and I flower and I feel full. And that is your opportunity. Your okay. opportunity is to take what are you seen as your raw potentials, these grapes here, and to convert them like into a fine wine. So your opportunity is to take your raw talents and do something with them, make, manifest them, and that brings you that fulfillment and happiness. Super card, super card. Well, thank you, James. Could you pick a card for your for the day? Oh, you want me to pick a card? Of okay, course, great. Of Why not? Why not? All right, let's see what I come up with. Now, there's many, many ways of choosing cards. Do it your way. That's the right way. So I like to close my eyes and with my left hand, just go <laughs> for it. And here we go. Here's my card for the day. Ecstasy. All right. It's called Ecstasy <laughs> with beautiful flowers. This is kind of the go to Hawaii card, if you will. <laughs> So my lesson today is not to get oh, upset and negative and fearful and crotchety and what's going wrong and all that kind of stuff, but to realize, hey, this is a beautiful life, I feel beautiful, and to live the ecstatic, divine kind of existence. So that's my lesson, and that's my opportunity. A lot like your fulfillment card, may right. I say. Yeah, we've got the same things. This seems real easy. I thought I had to study for a couple of years before I'd be able to do tarot. No, 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 no. Tarot is an immediate intuitive process. All of us have an intuition or an idea that is sparked by a picture. We all have to have it. And that's what tarot is all about, is following our intuitive hit, if you will, from each of these picture images. And hopefully it's fun. You know, uh, and what makes the tarot, I think, really a fun process is the magic and mystery of selecting cards face down. And in a way, it becomes like a, a game, kind of a, the game of life. The cards we pick is my hand. This is my hand for the day. Um, and when we're having fun, that's when we're most intuitive. When we're having fun, that's when we're most open, receptive, and therefore learn the fastest as when we were kids. And that's when we grow the fastest as a result. And when we're having fun, that's when we are healed. We become healthy through the process of fun. And so whenever we do a reading for ourselves or for another person, it's meant to be a fun, uplifting kind of experience. And so we are healed, the other person is healed. And because we're having fun in the tarot, we want to do it. And it's, as I said before, it's over the consistent practice constant practice of the tarot that we grow. And because it's fun, that means we want to do it over and over and over again. Well, can you tell me what fun things we're going to be learning today in this video? <laughs> sure. We're going to be learning the heart and soul of the tarot. And those are the 22 major arcana cards. These are the 22 universal laws, principles, secrets of the universe. And from these 22 major cards, we're going to do what I call a life reading. We will find out what our life cards are. And also, we're going to be doing what I call a year reading to determine in whatever year of our life we want to look at what our opportunity is for that particular year. If I do not have a Voyager tarot deck, can I still get a lot out of this video and maybe use another tarot deck? Yes, absolutely. For the, the 22 major cards that we're going to be studying today, 
are the same 22 major cards in all true tarot decks. Now, each deck might represent those 22 cards differently with different symbolic imagery, but the concepts are the same for all 22. As well, the various reading techniques, the principles, and the readings themselves that we're going to be doing today are readings and techniques that one could use with any deck. And I think it's really important to understand that the basis of tarot is learning how to understand symbols and how to read symbols. And we're going to be learning the fundamentals of reading symbols. And by learning those fundamentals, you'll be able to apply them to any kind of tarot deck, Voyager or otherwise. And also in today's video workshop, everything that we're going to be learning will be included in the Voyager Tarot guidebook, which comes right with the deck. It includes definitions for all the cards, as well as all the techniques that we practice today. And these same kinds of techniques and practices are also il illustrated in the Voyager Tarot Way of the Great Oracle book, which is an expanded guidebook to the cards. Sounds like fun. Let's get going. Great. I'm all for it. Let's go. Legend has it that the ancient tarot was derived from ancient Egypt. And legend has it that tarot as a word means tarot or royal road. And then I asked myself, well, the royal road to where? And it's interesting, the word tarot, because if you turn the letters around, it becomes rota, R-O-T-A. And rota means the wheel or the rotary. So the tarot as the royal road takes us on the wheel of life, the full wheel of life. And so the tarot is really a spiral journey that takes us through our life destiny. And that journey is depicted here with the 22 major arcana cards. We start out as the fool and we move through the spiral journey of life. Each of the 22 major cards represent the various spokes on the wheel of life or the way stations that we must travel in our life destiny from the fool all the way to the universe, the culmination of our lives. So what I'd like for you to do now is to get out your major arcana cards. These are the cards that have the Roman numerals on them, and they are numbered 0 through 21. And I would like you to put them in order, 0 through 21. Major arcana means the major secrets, laws, or principles of life. OK, now that you've done that, I want to enforce the fact that these 22 major cards really represent the principles of life. We all have to live all of these principles in, to be whole, complete, healthy individuals. But not only do they represent those 22 principles of life, but they represent what I call personality archetypes. You know the great psychologist Carl Jung? He discovered in all cultures, in their art, in their dreams, in their myths, in their language, that every culture had certain types of individuals. For example, every culture has a magician type of personality. Uh, we might call it a magician. In another culture, it might be the wizard. It could be the sorcerer. It could be the shaman. It could be the witch. It could be the coyote. So there are many, many different words for the magician. But magicianness seems to permeate every culture. Now, according to the philosophy psychology of the tarot, we all have the magician within ourselves. So the personality archetypes represented by the 22 major cards are, in fact, sub-personalities within each of us. So we are a living community of these 22 different, what I call, archetypal sub-personalities. OK, now let's take a voyage 
through these so-called major arcana cards. And really, this is a voyage into our destiny and into our sub-personalities. And the first stop, or the first place of commencement, actually, on that life voyage is with the first card in the tarot, which is the number zero card, the fool. Or in the case of the Voyager deck, it is called the fool child. Like the fetus and dependent child, you live on faith in the order of the universe. You know that you are taken care of. It Knowledge. The lovers, symbolized by the conjoined male and female, is the law of union, oneness through the marriage of opposites. The Gemini twins, the duality of man and woman, sun and moon, jungle and desert, black and white, symbolize sameness and difference. Life is ambiguous for you. Keep your center amidst the pool of opposite forces. Union creates disunion, and disintegration creates integration. Synthesis and division are twins. The lovers is embracing the opposites. Be intimately involved with others, but also maintain your own self-integrity. Be feminine, but also masculine. Recognize your individuality, but also see yourself in others. The chariot, symbolized by the Greek charioteer, represents the law of motion. Your mind, body, heart, and spirit are constantly moving, running toward their highest possible attainment. You take the challenge to explore all possible pathways to reach the ideal. You're an adventurer, traveler, conqueror, and hunter. As Cancer, you carry your shell or home on your back. Your security is within yourself. The trance-like stare of the charioteer symbolizes the meditative detachment and awareness that give you an inner stillness as you move about. Your movement then becomes effortless, and you stay centered amidst changes. Balance is the law of action and reaction. The number eight of balance symbolizes balance amidst ever-present change. Balance is a dance, a continuum of Libra-like mental adjustments to keep your equilibrium. You are analytical and creative, mathematical and poetic, intellectual and dreamy, decisive and reflective. Like the balancing sword of justice, you possess an objectivity which enables you to evaluate the pros and cons, the pluses and minuses. Balance is known in the traditional tarot as justice. Like a judge, you act with fairness. You seek equality in relationships. You maintain a sense of proportion in your life. The Mayan death mask is symbolic of the hermit, who shuts out worldly distractions in order to complete his spiritual pilgrimage and temporal work. The hermit symbolizes the law of perfection, you become complete by uniting the highest states of attainment in the material and spiritual realms. To achieve this perfection, the Virgo Hermit in you brings health and harvest to the physical and material life, which serves as the temple of the spirit. You seek material security and self-sufficiency so that you can go inward to the inner temple to gain self-knowledge and to live in union with the divine. By getting in touch with the higher self, you bring this power through your hands to heal, create, and guide. The Blackamoor bearing the treasures of Dresden symbolizes the law of prosperity. You prosper by knowing how to receive the wealth of opportunities that come to you from the cornucopia of the universe. You are opportunistic and entrepreneurial. You are resourceful, able to turn a negative into a positive. To seize an opportunity, you must be courageous, a risk taker like the matador. Like Jupiter, you must think expansively and decide how you can bring available resources together to create synergy. As the dancer on the wheel of fortune, 
you must be agile, flexible, and alert, always ready to move. As Leo the Lion, symbolic of rulership, strength represents the law of self-dominion. Strength as dominion is the controlled but free and total expression of your being. As symbolized by Shu, Egyptian god of the air, who brought order out of chaos, you possess dominion over your mind. Like the singing bird and blossoming flower, you are not afraid to declare yourself and show your colors. You have the courage of the lion to be yourself. You are versatile, a player of many roles. As the fragile but strong egg and butterfly, you express yourself in the yin and yang. Strength is to live in full accord with the undiluted fullness of your spirit. The upside-down hanged man symbolizes the law of reversal. As in the crucifixion of Christ, victory and success are achieved in a manner opposite from any expected. Instead of assertive movement and forceful resistance, salvation is attained through passive surrender. Acceptance of your limitations brings expansion. Surrender your ego. The feeling that you are drowning and being dragged to the depths is the dark night of the soul. The preparatory stage for rebirth and new life. The hanged man is symbolic of compassion at self-sacrifice, like Christ. Giving yourself up for the good of others enables you to transcend the ego and achieve union with the great spirit of the universe. Death is the law of impermanence. All things must end. Death can occur by a natural evolutionary shedding, letting go, or release. As symbolized by the knife-like nose beak of the New Guinea spirit mask, death may be consciously invited by a cutting away of what is dead, stagnant, or oppressive. Death may sadden you, but ultimately it's liberating. To fear death is not to live. You cannot live unless you're willing to die. Only by letting go can you allow life in. Art, represented by Athena, the Greek patron goddess of the arts, symbolizes the law of creativity. You are a creative artist in all aspects of being and in all endeavors of worldly life. Creativity is an alchemical art of dissolving old forms and recombining them as a new synthesis. See the disintegration of your life as a creative opportunity. As Sagittarius, you communicate yourself to the world by shooting forth through the rainbow your ideas, visions, and products. Your creative expression, like the orchid, has an impact on the world. The Greek Dionysian players in Devil's Play symbolize the law of celebration. A Dionysian exultation of life and its hard work, bedevilments and erotic pleasures. Laugh your fears and sorrows away. Dance and drink to your successes, for life is a Saturnian harvest. Lift your spirits by passion and play. Recreate yourself through recreation. In your iconoclasm, you see a new way and break through Saturnian discipline and social convention. You free yourself and become natural, spontaneous and original. The tower, symbolizing the law of purification, is a revolutionary cleansing of all levels of your being. The Incan warrior jumping from the tower symbolizes the purging of your impurities. The burning effigy represents the burning up of your dark aspects. You see the mental patterns and beliefs you must destroy. By leaping into the alchemist's furnace, you melt down the old inner and outer structures. A metamorphosis occurs symbolized by the red-winged blackbird. There's a new dawning, and you restructure your life. The star symbolizes the law of luminosity. You shine like a star. Self-esteem comes with recognizing the star that you are. Standing in the star shower, you receive inspiration from the heavens. Your thoughts are lofty, imaginative, progressive, and inspiring. 
You are a guiding light to others, a way shower. The star is symbolized by Quan Yin, who like the Aquarius water bearer, is a servant of the universe. With compassion, you pour out your life-giving waters and radiate your life in the darkness to nourish and nurture the dry, barren, and needy. The moon, represented by its phases, symbolizes the law of cycles. Like the moon, you are experiencing gentle, conservative, evolutionary change, a continuity transformation in which natural completions create inherent new beginnings. Through your Aphrodite-like romantic and sexual feelings, you are easily attracted to others. You need to complete old relationships and or old patterns of relationships and move them in to a new phase. Apollo, representing reason and logic, is eclipsed in the background. You listen to what your moon dreams tell you. The night symbolizes your awareness of subconscious motivations and drives. As water and Pisces, symbolized by the double dolphins, you perceive people's patterns and cycles. The sun symbolizes the law of life. You are alive, animate, and active. Like the youthful King Tutankhamun who represents the morning sun, you are awake, your mind is alert, your body light, and your heart sunny. Your spirit soars and your golden fortunes grow. You're a full participant in the dance of life. By emanating your own vitality, you awaken others. By combining your energy with that of others, you create a new sun. A synergetic fireball that produces new life. Time space, known traditionally in the Tarot as Judgment or Eon, is symbolized by Shipe Totec, Aztec god of spring, who wearing the skin of a sacrificed human, represents the new life which attends the death judgment of old karmic patterns. This is a time for rendering justice to yourself through objective and acute self-evaluation. The law of karma, the law of laws symbolized by time-space, means that you are able to see the causes and effects of your mental and behavioral patterns. Through your vision, you are able to alter the future and redirect your karma. As a traveler in consciousness, you transcend the world of matter and go in mind anywhere for any time. You are a futurist and seer. Your visions and ideas are seeds that bubble forth to alter minds and perceptions. The universe symbolizes the law of universality. You are the universe. Like the center stone you possess within yourself, the universe of possibilities. You are whole and perfect, but as the uncompleted sculpture, the awakening giant, your life is an unfinished process. Always in a state of becoming, you are simultaneously completing and beginning. You are recreating your life through death and rebirth and building for yourself a new world, a new universe, and a new you. Now from the major arcana cards, we can determine what our particular life cards are. In other words, where each of us are on that journey of life, on the wheel of life. And so from these life cards that we're going to learn how to discover for ourselves, then we can learn what our life purpose and potentials are. So the way you determine your life cards are two different ways. The first way is through numerology. Every, almost every tarot card has a number. And what we're going to do is determine what our birth number is and then correlate that birth number with one of the major arcana cards, and that will be your life card. Now, to do that, what you need to do is follow along here with the example. Let us say your birthday is in April. So that would be the fourth month. So write down your birth month. Write down the birth month. Okay? Then add the birth month to your birth day. Let's say the April 19, 19 here. So we're going to add those two together. 
and that equals 23. All right? Now, to that number, you will then add your complete birth year. In this case, 1943, let's say. Okay, and then you add those two together. So this would be 6, 6, 9, 1. So you end up with a four-digit number. Then you add a crosswise. 1 plus 9 plus 6 plus 6. And in this case, it equals 22. So, if after adding all these numbers up, if your number, double-digit number, is 22 or less, then correspond it with one of the major arcana cards. If your number is actually 22, that is the fool. The 22nd major arcana card is seen as the fool, number 22. If your number is above 22, just hold on. Because some of us have more than, uh, than one life card. Some of us have two. Some of us have three. So there's a variety here. So this, let us say this was my birthday. The number 22 card would be the fool. So one of my life cards would be the fool. Now what you do, everybody with their double digit number, is add the double digits together. And in this case, it would equal four. So the single digit number is also your life card. Now let us say one of your numbers was, it came up to be 23. Well, there's only 22 major cards, so you just simply have to add two and three equals five. So some of you may have only one life card according to this system. Now as a four, I am also the number four major arcana card which would be the emperor, okay? Now, some of you, this is an interesting one, your numbers might add up originally to 19. 19 is the sun, one of your life cards, but then one plus nine equals 10. Fortune, another one of your life cards, but then one plus zero equals one, the magician, another one of your life cards. So some of you might have three life cards doing it this numerological way. Some of you might have two, and some of you might just have one. And that's okay. If you've come in with only one life card via this number way of doing it, then you are here to really intensely experience the quality and energies of that particular archetypal quality within you. All right, so what you do is lay out all those life cards that you've determined here through this addition of the numbers. Now, the second way, the second way to find out more of your life cards is astrologically. The major arcana is really incredible because all 12 zodiac signs are in the major arcana plus the 10 planets. 12 and 10 adds up to 22 a perfect system, astrologically. So if you are an, an Aries, now what we're doing is using your sun sign. Aries is the emperor. Taurus is the hierophant. Gemini is the lovers. And Cancer is the chariot. Leo is strength. Virgo is the hermit. Libra is balance or justice and Scorpio is death. Sagittarius is art, Capricorn devil's play, Aquarius star, and Pisces the priestess or moon. Those are the 12 signs. So now pull out your life card that is determined according to your sun sign in the zodiac. So what you have now are your life cards, and what are they? What do they really indicate? They indicate who you can be in this lifetime. Now, they could also indicate your blocks. Like you might get a card and say, huh, that's the thing I do least well. Well, that is your karmic opportunity and lesson in this lifetime is to learn how to cultivate that quality in order to do it well. 
Now, how do we interpret these life cards? Well, again, it gets back to the dialoguing with ourselves through symbols. So, for example, uh, if somebody's life card were number two, the priestess, the priestess, and you're looking at the priestess card, then how would I interpret it for myself? Well, you would look at the various symbols on the priestess and ask yourself, how am I like the quality or qualities represented by this priestess card or all the symbols on it? How am I like those qualities symbolized in the card? So here we have uh, the priestess. This is a moon that sits on top of her head. What might the moon mean? What does the moon symbolize to anyone? Receptivity, receptivity. So then you would ask yourself, how receptive am I? Am I a receiver or am I always putting out my own stuff and being always assertive? Or do I have the capability and the quality of the priestess to sit and wait and feel and hear and sense? Excellent. Anybody else have an interpretation or a meaning for the moon? Reflection. The moon reflects the sun's light. So you'd ask yourself, how reflective am I? Do I contemplate? Do I reflect? Do I evaluate? Or am I just a constant doer without thinking, without reflection? Uh, here's the dolphin. Here is the dolphin. What does the dolphin represent or symbolize? Anybody? Wisdom. Wisdom. OK. Uh, and certainly, that's a quality of, of the priestess. Now, how does the dolphin get its wisdom? How does it know anything? What is the process by which the dolphin gets information? Pardon me? This is communication, but what is the sonar? Sonar, sensing, vibrations, vibrations. And that's what the priestess does. She is able, and again, we are all priestesses within us. We are all able to sense the vibration. You know, somebody comes into the room and it's like, oh, I don't know, you know, about them. What we're doing is picking up the vibration, like the priestess. What about all the water? What about the water? What does that symbolize? What does water represent? Life, what else? The beginning of life? Emotion? The last peaceful frontier, that's beautiful. The subconscious? Cleansing. Cleansing? OK. Here we have five, six, seven different interpretations of water. None of them are wrong. All of them are right. The beauty about the tarot is there are no wrong answers. There's only your answer, and that's the right answer. So you would reflect, a la the priestess, on water, and how am I like water? Or how am I not like water? Maybe you're a real fiery type, an Aries or a Leo or something. And you may need to temper some of that fire with the water. So you would call upon your inner priestess to calm down and be more peaceful and flowing and soft like water. So that's basically what tarot is all about. That's reading the tarot. It's taking a look at a symbol. What does that represent? And then how does that represent a quality within me? So anybody can do it. If you, if you can tell me what something means in any of the cards, that means that you know it in yourself. Because we cannot know anything outside of ourselves. If you can tell me what anything means, what the moon would represent, or what these pillars, or what the owl might mean, or the sphinx, or the ice, or whatever, you can tell me what it means, then you know that in yourself. And then you are living out that quality, that archetypal quality of the priestess. And that is the tarot in a nutshell. And that's why everyone can do it. OK, does anybody have questions about their particular life cards, the profile that you have in front of you? Um, with my life cards, I have the emperor and the moon. They seem very opposite. How would I integrate those two? How to integrate the emperor and the moon as your two life cards. Because you're a number four, your life card is the emperor. And this represents the male energy in you. That's fire, the ability to 
act out your dream in the world. And it's interesting, I say your dream in the world, because as a Pisces, you are the moon, and the moon is the dream card. So your real purpose potential in this lifetime is to be a dreamer and to follow your dream and to build upon your dream in the world. And it is, so it is your male energy that gives you the strength to carry out and formulate the female card, the moon, which is symbolic of the dream world or the introspective world. So that's a really, really nice combination and a high potential there for you. It's excellent. Now, however, you might find that you're too dreamy. <laughs> and if you find yourself being too dreamy, then pull out the emperor and get it going. And for some of us who are particularly males, we might be too action-oriented and need to reflect more like the feminine moon card or Pisces. All right? Adding up all my numbers, the, I came to the same number as you did, the 22. My first card was the fool child. But then my uh, astrological sign was the hermit. So it seems somewhat, again, at an opposite to one another. I was uh -huh. wondering how you interpret these cards. OK, how to integrate the fool child with the hermit, hermit sage, sage, the Virgo. OK, great. Here's our resident fool here. Thank you for showing up. Uh, the fool is symbolic of your, your childlike genius. You've got the fetus here. And the fetus is connected to the gods and goddesses. Uh, and it's, so it's being like the zero fool, open, trusting, innocent, spontaneous, that the magic comes through you here. So this represents your inner kid. And you never, ever want to let that kid you know, get away from you. You always want to be the child. But you have the extra added kind of maybe responsibility or karmic opportunity or lesson to marry that inner child with the sage in the deck. And this represents the old soul that you are, the old sage, the one that knows, the grandfather that you are. And this is because you're Virgo. So you want to have that childlike innocence, but at that same time, that sage-like trusting of your knowledge that's here. And that's a very difficult integration to make. There are many kids running around, and there are many sages running around, but the ability to marry those two is really the nature of your unique alchemy. Not particularly easy, but if you can take the inspiration of your fool child and bring it through in the world, because again, Virgo is an earth sign. Let's make it happen in the world. That is when you are living the fullest power. So it's the integration of child and sage. All right? Okay. Now, from the major arcana cards, we can also determine what our year card is. Now, our year runs from birthday to birthday. Forget January 1. If your birthday is coming up tomorrow, that means 1989 starts for you tomorrow. So we're going from birthday to birthday. And the way you determine your year card, which comes from the major arcana, is that the tarot sees us moving in cycles of 22 years, according to that life destiny journey of 22 years. Apparently, in ancient Egypt, there were 22 temples of initiation along the Nile. So every 22 years, we move into a new cycle. And so we move through this cycle consecutively. So somebody give me their age. 41. OK. You're 41. So you've been through the 22-year cycle once. 22 plus. 19 gets you to 41. So you are in the 19th year of your second cycle of 22. So your card for when you are 41 would be the 19 card or the sun. The sun. Who else has an age for me to give? 38? OK. 22 years, you've been through that. The first 22 years are formulative. School, you know, all of that kind of stuff. From 22 to 44, it's generally getting established in life, professionally, family, house, mortgages, cars, you know, all those kinds of things. So, but it's interesting, 38, you're 22 years old plus 16 years. 22 and 16 is 38. So 
your, your year card is the 16 card or the tower. So that means this is a year for you to clean shop, clean your house, you know, purify what's not appropriate in your body or in your mind or in your life, in your world, and get it out. Get it out. In a sun year, if you're 19, this is a year to get healthy, get into the sun, get outdoors, be the sun, radiate your power. Who else has got another? 44. 34. Okay, 34. Huh, that's an interesting. 22 years plus 12. Gets you up to 34. So you're in a number 12 year, which is the hanged man. So this is a year where maybe things don't feel like they're moving real quickly. You're hung up. You're treading water, getting nowhere. So it's a year of patience. Patience. And kind of surrendering to your reality, whatever it might be, and letting go of that small ego. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. 46. All right. Diane here has been through the 22 year cycle twice. She's 44 years old plus two. So her card for this year is the number two card, the priestess. So if you want answers, go to Diane. She's got the wisdom, she has the knowledge. Now it's very, very important if your year card is the same as one of your life cards. So for example, Diane's number is two. Her life card is the priestess. This is her priestess year, so this is the year to really tune into your own priestess wisdom and perhaps to be the priestess in the world. So your year cards give you an indication of what your opportunities are for that year and what the, the possible lessons might be for that year. Also, what might be the possible blocks. And when I do a reading, many times I will start right out with the life cards and take a look at the pictures, picture of the person's life, the big picture with the life cards. Then I bring it in, telescope it in with the year card. And then we take a look at the present, which we will do in segment two. And then we take in a look into the possible future. But this ends our discussion and study of the major arcana cards. And I just want to say, out of these 22 major cards, you can practice the tarot. This is really all you need are these 22 cards right here. But if you want to experience the full power of the tarot, then it's important to learn what the so-called minor arcana cards are. And those are the cards that we are going to discuss in volume two of this tarot for the new age. Thank you.